Hello, this is Benjamin. No, it's not. Hello, this is Benjamin Boyce. Today's guest is Colin Wright, who is an evolutionary biologist and researcher into social insects. He studies spiders that get along and how wasps and other social insects um, act with one another and how different sorts of behaviors arise within these different colonies and then dictate the kind of personalities that these colonies have. So we take all that data and all those stories, these fascinating stories about these little creepy crawly things that go around together and hunt and do other uh, activities. I don't know what, what else they do but hunt and build things. Anyways, we take those stories and then we talk about um, his thoughts on how human beings interact with one another and the certain sorts of emergent properties of human social existence. You can find Colin on Twitter at swipe right. He also writes for Quillette and a number of other publications. And um, I think he even does TV stuff. Anyways, he's he's pretty damn handsome. So ladies, um, if you're in the Philadelphia area or maybe Pennsylvania area, you know, keep an eye peeled for somebody huddled over a sack of wasps. He might be the man that you're looking for. Here's Colin Wright. You reposted something from Nature magazine uh, that attempts to it, it reviews a book that is attempting to debunk the differences between male and female brains and you go through there and you point out to other resources and you make an argument that debunking that argument itself yeah yeah no that that, that thing took off like ben shapiro retweeted that earlier today and so it just kind of blew up somehow <laughs> yeah i got a i got a shapiro retweet once too it really takes the mentions to the next level yeah, I'm not even sure how he got it because he, he doesn't follow me for sure. So somehow it happened. But yeah, that that, that nature article is ridiculous. I, I've seen a few things in nature. At least this is the second thing, just to be completely honest. This is the second thing where they do this, uh, where it seems like they're going the route that there's no such thing as biology, um, that, that gender and sex are uh, something. There's no such thing as sex difference. Therefore, all gender expression is the norm or something. Yeah, I mean, I guess what what they do is they'll 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 deliver something that has, like, a kernel of truth to it. Because if you go in the article, um, like the one I retweeted today, like the 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 title was you know something like the myth of sex differences, you know that's it's just a complete myth. But then when you look at their claims they make, they say like, um, male and female brains, like no one's able to but been able to show that they're completely different. You know, like two different distinct categories. Yeah. But like, but that's just a complete straw man. Like, no one is saying that. Yeah. No scientist that I know, and I, I don't, I've never heard anyone say that. Like, there is no overlap or variation between, between you know the personality traits or things with with with, with people or the, the brains. And that's not what anyone would expect to see. But hmm. so so they have that's that's the thesis they're defending in the piece. But then the title is completely just suggestive yeah. of you know everything's the same there's no you couldn't even there's just no statistical differences whatsoever which is just completely false it it just it seems like that line of thinking which it's a shame that nature of all things is pushing this but it seems that that kind of thinking comes down to this conflation of what is equality and is is anything less than perfect parody bigotry it just seems like the, the mentality of like talking about differences is somehow in itself sexist or just saying that mm -hmm. men and women statistically uh, they overlap a lot, probably more than any other species. That's one thing that I've heard. But even just saying that there's a difference means that male must be better and therefore you're a bigot just for, by saying that. Is that do you think that that is what's driving that mentality or is that I'm straw manning? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of them are at least suggesting in the actions and what they they seem to be saying, they have like this this fatalistic notion, it seems, of of what it means to say that there are differences. Um, and they seem to ignore the fact that when people, when a biologist says, you know, um, males and females differ in, you know, their personality traits. Again, we're not saying that there are just like blue and pink boxes. What we're saying is there's average differences, lots of overlap, but that like these things do separate out in, in you know, in, in data space basically yeah uh and you, you can create models especially if you use sort of a multivariate approach if you're taking multiple personality traits into consideration simultaneously like maybe yeah sure maybe one trait like conscientiousness or something is gonna give you um equivocal results 
So that if you look at, say, all of the big five personality traits together, then you can make extremely high mm. uh, predictive accuracy. If you were to receive a, a survey of someone's you know, report of their personality traits, you could, with a high degree of certainty, pick out what their sex is if mm. you consider like every personality trait uh, in combination, basically. So yeah, so th they're they're using this this fatalistic notion that if we mm. say that there are differences, that means that these are they're they're categorical differences mm. and that there's there's no overlap. But again, that's just a strong straw man. There's no one <laughs> that I've ever met that's yeah. saying anything like that. Well, what do we do with the data that we come up with? I mean, I guess the data itself could be used to nefarious ends, but what's the use of I guess the fact that male and females uh, have significant overlap, but uh, a variance that's mappable or a difference that's mappable. Uh, I mean, it depends on, on, on what your goals are. I mean, I'm sure that, yeah, there are going to be some nefarious people out there who are going to look at differences and they're just going to get, they're going to use that to make that same category error and saying that, mm -hmm. you know, if they're, if they differ in this one aspect, that means they're worse or something. Uh, but, you know, if, if we're looking at maybe something like best practices for educating people, um, maybe there's differences in how different personality traits are more amenable to certain types of uh, education tactics. Um, if we're looking, if we want to know about, you know, big hot topic going around is, you know, who's, uh, what types of jobs are people interested in? Uh, and we look, seems to be the, the case now that people just sort of look, they average across all positions and they'll see that there's not a perfect 50 50 percent uh you know distribution of, of men and men and women in certain fields and they'll conclude that that's due to you know in, inherent bigotry in the system or some, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. systemic when it could just be these personality differences so we know that yeah women are more or more people oriented and, and uh men are more thing oriented you know broadly construed and we should we should we shouldn't expect these this perfectly equal parity mm -hmm. uh in in professions so there's there's all types of yeah. of things that it could potentially matter for. Uh, but then again, the, the thing that needs to be stressed in is that differences uh, in just the data don't mean that there's differences in the value of the human being that's there. I mean, we, we know that males are taller than females on average, but we don't think that's, we don't like, we don't hate short people. Well, Maybe yeah, but people do, taller but people are people. closer to God. So, I mean, it just yeah. follows, right? You know? Yeah, I mean, I know they do say like tall people are more likely to get promotions or something and they're mm -hmm. more likely to have like managerial positions so there could be some you know uh, oh yeah some some bias you know subconscious thing where we imbue traits to certain individuals but um yeah mm -hmm. that's it is what it is mm -hmm. so what's your area of research right now yeah so right now so i'm doing i study animal personality hmm. so it's it's kind of like you know studying human personality but uh, it's, it has to be studied in a slightly different way just because you can't like have animals fill out surveys basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the things we look at are things that are more, uh, read more easy to measure basically like, uh, how, how bold an individual is. So their, their propensity to put themselves in like risky situations, mm -hmm. uh, looking at things like aggressiveness or how sociable individuals are, how active they are, how, how much they explore their environment, things like that. Uh, so for my dissertation, I worked mainly with, with social spiders, uh, and it's basically looking at how individual differences in their personalities, you know, within a colony, between individuals, uh, how the personality distribution of a colony hmm. will kind of lead to the emergent group-level personalities, and then how that matters for how the colony is performing certain tasks like oh. collective feeding, uh, collective defense, you know, how they all cooperate in building uh, building their nest structures or capture webs and things like that, uh, taking in prey. Uh, so it's kind of looking at the evolutionary ramifications of this. So usually our response variable is something like entire colony depth if we're doing it in the field. So does does, does personality of the group matter for survival in different, con in different contexts? Uh, so that's what I did for hmm. my dissertation. Now I'm more interested in, I'm doing a lot of stuff with paper wasps, uh, linking like the personalities of the queens early in the season when they f found their nests just by themselves hmm. uh, looking at if I can predict say the colony level behavior yeah you know 
one or two months in the future just by knowing the behavior of of the queen so does the does the founding individual of an entire group matter for group level differences and that does that influence their survival um, and I'm also working with ants too looking at cognition and decision making based on on group personality and if they change their decisions basically if they're hmm. in a context that's uh, that's that makes them fearful like if there's a predator or a competitor present versus hmm. you know absent just by themselves so, so, so that's in with, a nutshell with the uh, paper wasps is it too early for you to talk about like conclusions are you close enough to talk about conclusions with this oh, no, I've done yeah I've, I've done some stuff with them um, during my dissertation I just it's, it just didn't make it into my dissertation I made that all about spiders yeah uh, but right now with with paper wasps so this was research I did several years ago Hmm. I'm going to be doing, I've been doing it for the last maybe four summers. Uh, but we do find that uh, if you measure the queens, so there's a, there's a behavioral assay that I've developed. Um, and it's, it's basically, uh, we poke them with a stick. <laughs> this is how, this is how a lot of things go down in like animal <laughs> behavior research. You know, we might say it like we give them like 10 Stimulus. iterative prods to their anterior, but literally it's just like we're poking them with a stick and we're seeing what they do. Uh, so what I found, this was based on like some observations I made in the field originally, uh, hmm. where I'd, I'd try to collect some queens off their nests, and I'd realize that some would just like fly away when I get too close, or if I, if I miss them the first time, they'd, they'd leave their nest. Uh, and then some just seem to like stand their ground more on their hmm. nest. And I thought that was kind of interesting, and I'd go back and I'd, the same queen would kind of fly away like if, like time and time again. Uh, and so I got all these queens in the lab. They had, you know, maybe 60 or so queens just uh, chilling in their little nest boxes in the lab. And so I just said, just asked a question of like, how many, you know, pokes does it take for these things to, to fly away? And if you do this, you know, you do it that four different times, you know, I give them up to like 50 prods with a stick. It's sort of this mm -hmm. general antagonistic stimulus we'll call it hold on uh, one second is oh, yeah. this like a scientific stick or just a stick that you found on the ground somewhere well it's, it's like a, a wooden dowel that i bought at walmart okay <laughs> so it's, yeah it's <laughs> okay, just more wondering. scientific than most of the stuff we use uh and so basically we'll get one queen we'll poke it up to like 50 times and we'll see how many times does it take for them to abandon their nest or not abandon but retreat and then yeah. they'll come back later and so you do this, you know, over the course of a week, multiple times for individuals, and you can get an idea of if individuals are consistently behaving the same way, which is basically the, def the definition of personality in there. So are there personality differences yeah. between queens in the way they're responding to this? And I found it's almost a bimodal distribution, too. So some of these queens, you poke them once or twice, and they'll fly away from their nest to come back again uh, when, 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 you're, when you're gone. Uh, but then some queens will just completely stand their ground. They'll never leave. They're just going to try to sting and bite this, the prod. Uh, and sometimes they'll go up to 50 prods. So they never leave their nest. Hmm. Uh, so this was something I found like, in one of my first years of researching this. So the next year, I wanted to find out if this, uh, if this actually matters for their colony behavior. So I did these same, same tests. Uh, and then after I knew what the queen's personality was, I kind of let them build their colonies in the lab and, until all their workers came out. And then once their workers came out, uh, I antagonized their entire colonies. So mm. I would like I'd have this thing that would vibrate their entire colonies. Okay. And then there's this visual stimulus in front of them that goes back and forth. And I basically mm. see. Uh, so at first I give them just a visual stimulus. It's kind of this metronome going back and forth. And some colonies would attack that right away. But some required, you know, the vibra vibrations plus the visual. And I'd be looking at just how aggressive they are. Are they flying off their nest to attack? this visual stimulus. And what it turns out is the, the queens that were more likely to hold, to, to stand their ground when you gave them poke after poke, gave rise to entire colonies where the workers were much less likely to fly off their nest. Like they also stood their ground. Mm -hmm. And even when the whole colony is being vibrated, hmm. whereas the, the queens that were more likely to fly away after a poke or two gave rise to colonies where just the visual stimulus alone was often enough to make them just go crazy and fly off their nest and try to attack you. Is so, this is this purely genetic? Is there any sort of socialization that the queen gives to their brood? Or so is it purely, they just we, like the we egg. Have, we have we have no idea. So we're that's something that I'm testing this year by doing a, a queen swap. So because uh, the, the the workers will work for whoever whatever queen is there, uh, regardless, they'll just assume that's their that's their mom. 
<laughs> and so right before workers come out this next season, I'm going to be swapping, you know, bold queens to stand their ground with shy queens that fly away and seeing if, if they take, if the colony takes on the behavior of, you know, their, their related queen or this new surrogate queen. Uh, this that's basically, yeah, that's what I'm doing this year. Uh, and then last year we found that uh, the queens that are more likely to stand their ground also uh, have larger colonies at the end of the year. So it's, it seems to have a, a link to their their overall colony productivity and fitness. Have you so, have you studied like where the like if where the uh, bold versus I guess shy uh, queens come from? Do they are they produced by each other or are you able? To yeah, we we have that? we have no clue. So we're okay. we're just collecting them at a few campsites in Pennsylvania. And, okay. Yeah, it's it's really hard to track them because they they disperse, uh, you know, at the end of the the season and then they they go into these little called hibernacula, which are little areas under in, under rocks or in, in dead trees or something under bark, and they still mm-hmm. hibernate there over the winter, and you, it's almost impossible to find them. So there's, there's some papers on it, and I always wonder, like, how are they finding these things? Yeah. So you've been dealing with social insects for several years now, what, five, six, seven, ten years? Like that's that. about six years, yeah, I guess since, since grad school. I've, I graduated just last year, so. Okay. Yeah. And in in your research, I, I wonder if you've thought uh, about like bringing the what you've learned about social insects, and then how does that map on to what you see in the social world of human beings? And I mean, one path we can go down that is like when you brought up a bold queen. I was wondering, like, have you thought about like, well, what is Trump gonna do to our country, kind of thing? Like having like a, <laughs> a Trump leader versus an Obama leader, uh, and how does that affect uh-huh. a country level? But our our mechanism of governance is so far removed from uh, like paper wasp. There's all these checks and balances. There's this huge apparatus yeah. that it takes. It probably takes way too long for the effect of a leader, a single leader in our society to have a direct effect on, on society at large. But like, that's the question. What do you think about? Yeah. Yeah. So w- when I gave my whole dissertation defense, I, d- I got a question on, on like, what does this mean for humans? And that blindsided me, I had no idea. But since then, I've been thinking a lot about like, yeah, what does, you know, of course, I'm studying spiders and wasps, but like, you know, there, it's only you can't help but think about yeah. if you see these similar patterns in the population. Uh, specifically with, with your question about leaders, uh, it's funny you ask because um, a big part of what I've been studying in spiders uh, are this phenomenon called keystone individuals. So a keystone individual is basically any individual in a social group that has a disproportionate influence on group dynamics than any other type of like generic individual. Okay, um, we see this with certain like uh, groups of elephants. Or you say like so so older elephants they have a knowledge of like where all the watering holes are in the area, and so they can guide their entire group to certain watering holes. Okay, um, and and if you if when these these matriarchs when they die. The entire group suffers because they lose that knowledge. So they're example of like a keystone individual. Uh, there's also examples in, in say, in 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 water striders, where you'll have certain males that are just like so so aggressive uh, when, during mating that they will actually depress the entire mating success on the entire pond because everyone else is sitting on the pond, you know, just appropriately like they know the the rules of engagement for trying to like mate with other water striders. But then you'll get this one male, and we've probably seen human examples in bars or something, who will just <laughs> basically whip it out and just like just ruin everything, and every, no one wants any of this, and the entire pond will just basically everyone will scatter. Uh, huh. So these are these are constantly used as an example of a keystone individual, uh, and uh, and a keystone doesn't need to be positive for a group; it can yeah. it can be negative, like in the in this case. Uh, and in my spiders that I study, there's it's this African desert social spider that I study. Um, there's keystone individuals in this group too. So if you have an entire group of shy spiders, um, which we sort of measure as their, we, we give them an antagonistic stimulus and they, they, they huddle up in a ball and then uh, we look at how long it takes for them to unhuddle, like how long for them to be, uh, to feel that it's safe when the coast is clear. Some individuals, you know, they'll huddle for a second and they'll get out of it, they'll just start moving. Some will stay huddled for a long time. Uh, and so, uh, if we compose an entire colony of nothing but like really shy individuals, uh, they tend to perform less well than colonies that are composed of like all really bold individuals. 
Uh, they'll attack with fewer spiders. They'll attack slower. They're not going to repair the web as much, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. But if you add just like a single highly bold individual to this group of all shy individuals, over time, just in the course of just a couple of days, it'll increase uh, the number of attackers by like 400% and how fast the entire colony uh, oh, wow. uh, responds to prey. Uh, and the, these effects um, are hmm. actually proportional to how bold the individual is that you put in the colony. Uh, and these effects last if if you remove the bold individual too. Really, there's sort of a le- there's a, there's a legacy effect as well. Huh. Uh, and so and so, what we found recently in a in a study we published I think two years ago now, uh, is we found so we we did a big study in Africa with these species um, across like a, an east west gradient and north south gradient uh, that's basically representing two different um, I guess. Uh, Rainfall gradients, basically. Okay. So we had arid and wet environments going in in orthogonal directions, and what we found is that the colonies that were in the wetter areas, we didn't see any any keystone effects, but in the areas that were in the deserts, we found that keystone effects were really robust. And then so so we resource like maybe, dependent. Yeah. So so the the question we asked was whether or not are the keystones. You know, there's just bad leaders. Maybe there's just no no bold individuals. Uh, but what we found is that uh, it's actually the social group itself that is less susceptible to leaders. Oh. So it's not huh. that it's not that the it's not that there's not so the 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 spider equivalent of a charismatic leader. It's that the population itself is less susceptible to it. Uh, and so. Um, and is that because in the wet zones there's more resources, or that, that's the what, idea? Yeah, the, 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 the individual leader is, to... is better in like a yeah. That's the kind of the idea that a, a leader is more important in the desert where prey is far fewer between. Uh, you know, it's you're more likely to starve, and so yeah, the, the, there's more influence of these. Whereas hmm. in the wetter habitats, there's more prey to capture, so uh, you know everyone's more well fed all the time. So what oh. we did is we did cause we, we would take keystones. Of bold spiders from an arid population and put them in the colony of a um, of a of a wet population and they actually they're, they're not like ants and bees they don't uh, discriminate against a foreigner coming into their their colonies they'll accept them readily hmm. uh, and we found that that a an arid population would actually would follow a bold keystone that came from a wet population uh, but then it, w- it wouldn't happen the other way around. And even if we got a bold spider from another species, closely related species, but a different species, and put it in the arid population, the, the arid population would still follow it. They'll follow anything that resembles a charismatic spider huh. uh, in any way. So this it could be interesting with the, with human politics, too. Yes. Um, looking at the difference between certain political, you know, I don't know if it's going to be based, but party-based or something, but uh, the, the, the idea itself that there could be more there could be populations that are more susceptible to say a Donald Trump or yeah. something uh, rather than the leader qualities themselves. Yeah. So, well, not even susceptible, but yearning for a type of leadership that's softer or harder. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it could, it could, it could be not like personality traits of the group. It could be uh, external forces that are, that are making, making the population more uneasy and m- mm. more ready for some, big bold leader to come around and yeah. they could follow them. So, so that's, I think one thing that had made me kind of look into the human uh, condition more with, with my research, especially with that whole keystone uh, individual thing and the rise of Donald Trump. Yeah. I was wondering um, about the keystone individual. Have you like recognized those across different species of animal and insect and stuff like that? And I wonder, the question is, what is the keystone individual or the qualities that form the keystone individual tell us about the animal species? Like you're saying with the elephant, the one that has knowledge, it defines what an elephant is in in a certain way, Um, Mm -hmm. as opposed to like, I guess, the mating pond thing. It kind of defines what that species is really all about or what that species, uh, what that says about the species in the environment and the the relationship between them. Uh Uh-huh. So you're asking what what is like similar properties between species that have keystones? Well, no, that... I, I just wonder if if the keystone individual defines the species in a certain 
uh, respect, mm. just as like we could say, because there is a, a way of looking at history that defines history as the great, I think it's called the great man, uh, you know, kind of like history yeah. is just these peaks of great men. And, and if you just go through, like, I'm just coming off the top of my head, not to be Eurocentric or anything, but like somebody like a Leonardo da, da Vinci says something about the culture, like what, what the culture gave rise to is embodied in, in Leonardo. Yeah. In, in a certain mm-hmm. respect, Leonardo is not just an individual, a genius individual, but he's the summation. He's the high water mark. He's the keystone of that time, yeah. that that era. That. Yeah, I mean, you you could probably look at keystones as, in some sense, being, being these, these behavioral outliers, and, you know, as I said, to be a keystone doesn't doesn't need to be a positive. It can be negative. But for the species that it has a positive effect, yeah, I think it probably could define the species. Mm, okay. So like in my spiders, for instance, like they're very important probably for their survival in these arid environments to catalyze more more individuals to join mm. in an attack, especially in an arid environment where, you know, most of the prey that comes by is, well, one, it's very infrequent, and two, the prey is very large. Like this is thought to be the biggest driver of sociality in spiders in the first place, oh. where... That they, they they come together because the prey that comes by are usually very large and too large for any single spider to subdue on their own, and so they need to have a coalition in order to to successfully subdue these these things. Well, how so big? What's spi- the ratio of you know, body mass between an individual social spider and the typical prey? Like what are we talking oh, it's, about? It's usually it's usually uh, I don't have any good numbers for you, but they're I mean many many times the size. Like okay, could average. you give an and example? These... Like do they take down mice? Is that what they uh, we have found? Down? We have found a mouse carcass in our social spider colonies before. <laughs> we've never seen them eat one, but they probably could. Um, we've definitely so we have. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for this, but we sometimes in the in the field we'll have these colonies that we call these misfit colonies will be individuals that uh, that are sort of an intermediate personality that we can't really, that they're not going to be working for our experiment. We can't put them in an all bold. So like uh, a literal colony, intellectual we'll dark web then. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll make this big colony of just misfits from, they're just individuals from all these different colonies. And, oh. uh, and sometimes we'll just, you know, try to um, satisfy our morbid curiosity and saying like, well, what can these things take down? Well, we, we don't, we don't, we don't put mammals in them, but we'll, we'll find like, you know, a big scorpion or something. <laughs> well, well, you know, we, we say we're feeding the colony, but in, in, in reality, we're just like, we want to watch what, what's going to happen. And I mean, they'll take down a big colony, a big colony of social spiders, even if they're very tiny, like adolescents, they can take down a pretty good sized scorpion. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. And it's, it's, it's partially a combination of the web, them beginning, in, you know, entangled in the web and also a combination of them just, you know, each grabbing a leg and holding the thing down so it can't really squirm away. Really? Um, how do they thing, communicate? Yeah. Is it is it just purely... Uh, intuition is the wrong word, but how do they know what to do when they're acting as a group? Yeah, it's it's almost all vibrational. So, huh. yeah, they respond to um, any vibration in their web because they're, they're actually their eyesight is incredibly terrible for this species. Okay. Most of their hunting is actually done at nighttime. Uh, so it's almost all vibrations, probably a little bit of chemical because we have seen them like devour like a severed leg of a, another spider with their near. They seem to be able to orient towards it. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's all vibrational uh, to some degree. And we'll see like, if there's a large beetle in their web, you'll see the spiders will come out. They'll, like, they'll just grab the legs and hold it down. Another spider will grab the other side. If you look on this, my, my, my main Twitter profile picture I have basically, it's a it's a picture of these spiders attacking an ant basically that's and they're all it's just like it's like on a stretcher it's just being completely Weird. like some sort of medieval <laughs> like apart. torture yeah basically yeah and it's, it's brutal they're they're How, super brutal what's the um average uh, group size for these species and yeah, are these very, mostly in africa because i've never heard of social spider before we started talking there are some in the in the u.s mainly on the east coast there's a genus called uh Analosimus. Uh, and there's a there's a few there actually have a, a gradient of how social they are as you go further uh, further north. So if you go further south, you go they're they're more social. And then you you will see solitary ones up north. So like where I am in Pennsylvania. But then as you go in South America, there's I think five or five or six maybe more of uh, in the same genus. 
and there's other there's other social spiders too that are less well known. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one I study is in in, in South Africa, so I guess Southern Africa. Um, they're a little easier to study. They're they're bigger. They're not as like spindly as some of the ones in the U.S. So you can you can like mark them with stuff and okay yeah. Um, they're, they're pretty hardy. They 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 ship well back to the U.S. They don't all die if you try to put them in the mail. Do they have so, a they, so they don't have a queen then? They just have a keystone leader. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, they, they don't always have keystones, but oh, okay. uh, they, they usually have quite a lot of behavioral variation in their in their colonies. Um, it's usually biased towards more shy individuals. So, so yeah, the bold keystone phenotype is sort of the rarer oh, phenotype in the group. The regressive. Yeah. But they do they have a, a queen then, or or anything like that? No, there's no. But they all basically participate in prey capture together. There's no uh, reproductive division of labor. They all they all take take care of each other's offspring mm-hmm. uh at the you know at the end of the season you know during the winter when all their their first batch of babies come out like all the the previous generation will just basically liquefy their insides and have their babies eat them as their oh. first meal so yeah <laughs> really males and females uh i think you know i think we've only looked at it in the females there's, there's a big highly skewed sex ratio so there's about 10 females to every male in this species. oh wow okay yeah. What what gives rise to that? Like, is there a story? That's a good there? question. A just so story. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Not sure. It's only they've only. It's one, I think there's only one of. I think there's only two. Well, there's this genus, and then there's another genus of of hammock spiders that also have a skewed sex ratio, and I'm not sure if they know exactly why that is. What caused you to pick insects over animals? Was there any uh, contention, like? Like when you uh-huh. decided to go down this path of study, like what caused you yeah. to go in this direction, and w- were there other paths as you narrowed? Let me just down? yeah. Well, well, for one, insects are considered animals still. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Like I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. They're, they're 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 not vertebrates. I went the invertebrate route. Uh, okay. And that's for for several reasons because, well, one, they they have um, shorter life cycles, and so you can be on just like a yearly, like my my wasp and the spider and the spiders. Every year, there's a whole new batch of, of spiders, mm-hmm. and so if you want to do like cross generational stuff, you can do that. Uh, you have very specific field seasons. Um, you can do an experiment, you know, multiple times a year with with new individuals. Uh, you don't have to take into account like previous experience if you're using the same one multiple times. And then the biggest thing would be that there's almost no regulations on what you need to do or, or what you can do with, oh. with insects. So yeah, we can do any experiments we can do leg removal stuff if we want to you know there's no there's no board of directors who's gonna get you on like ethics with with your spiders or wasps because because people <laughs> don't have feelings about spiders yeah it's, yeah it's, it's not that we it's not like we mistreat them <laughs> but like you know we can we can do things with them that would require a stack of paperwork if we were to try to do with say a, a bunch of dolphins or something like yeah. It would, yeah yeah so and what's yeah, your or, level of analysis? Do you go into like the biology and like how they move or stuff? Or are you you more interested in the social level and behavioral level? Yeah. So all my stuff that I've done in the past, it's basically been purely behavioral like assessment of what they're doing. Um, we've always treated sort of like genetics as and physiology as sort of this black box, you know. And, and in a way, it makes sense. Like it doesn't doesn't matter what's going on under the hood to some degree as long as. You know, you, you're looking at just how they're interacting with their environment and their behaviors that are conducive to survival or mm. death, basically. Mm. Uh, and so, but but now I'm in my postdoc, and so I'm in a lab that does a lot of a lot of genetic stuff. And so uh, I'm waiting for my the, the spring to come around because that's when my wasp season will start. And we have we're we're going to try to be looking at the genetic basis of of this behavioral difference we see in the queens. Uh, and to see if we can maybe like start some long-term project where we can track selection on okay. on those genes over time. Uh, yeah, so that's yeah. I'm definitely trying to broaden my my scientific toolbox and get more molecular uh, oh. during my, my current current time right now. Just because I feel well, one, they're cool questions to ask, and two, it's going to help make me a little bit more uh, marketable for faculty jobs, probably. Yeah, so yeah. That's uh, that's what I'm looking to do. So, in looking at genes, are you basically looking at heredity? Then you're just looking through v- at variance through time. You're not like going in and, and 
looking at the genome itself or is there like a crossover where you guys are playing with the genome and trying to make a super wasp spider flying bat? No, yeah, no, there's, there's no plans to doing any, any CRISPR stuff or like, you know, <laughs> adding genes or removing any. Uh, we have a few genes that we think could be associated with this. There's some genes that, are, that have been implicated in um, social behavior and aggressiveness in wasps and other uh, bees and ants and stuff. So these could be the genes that are on the basis of this, this behavioral dimorphism that we, we see in them. Mm. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to see if, if that is the case. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, the main idea, once we can identify this, then we can compare different populations and see uh, how the, if, if we have, especially if we have a population that differs in this behavior, maybe if all the queens are more, more stand your ground or some of this other population has more, uh, you know, flighty queens, we can mm. then maybe try to link that to aspects of their environment, say, like, how often are they being uh, predated upon by larger vertebrate predators or um, other other wasps of their own species that try to usurp their nests, which is a problem. And they get to things like um, rates of nest parasitism by flies and moths and things like that. Which oh, is wait, pretty, other, pretty uh, what are the flies and moths uh, feasting upon? The other the wasps or, or just the structure or? Why are they uh, on the, they're, they're feasting on their on their larvae basically okay yeah. so you, there's a few species of there's like these smaller parasitic wasps uh, that and also these these moths that are a big one and flies and they all kind of do the same thing um, at nighttime when all the wasps are kind of sleeping and not on the on the outside of their nest um, these moths and other insects will go and they'll lay some eggs on top of the, the open cells on the larvae and then once the larvae, they, they, they do this usually towards like the a later stage when the larvae are just about to like cap their cells and seal themselves off to, to, to pupate into a, you know, a full adult. Um, and then so once they cap the cells, then that's when these eggs hatch. And basically oh, these, these new larvae, these, these little caterpillars, basically if you're the moth or if you're the fly, these maggots will come out and just eat the pupae and then they'll burrow through the sides of the, the cells. Get and they'll the, start just getting all the other ones in like this circle, circle of death, basically, and just oh, wow. eating the eating the colony from like the inside out. And and they're completely safe during this time too, because all the all the wasps are on top, and the the these parasites are eating the larvae literally from from the bottom up. It's brutal. It's so sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing they do, can do. But it's, and is the colony screwed? Can they start over next year, or do they have just a one year lifespan? So yeah. So sometimes they'll notice that something's going on and you'll see at the end of the year that there's these big, big holes in the colony where the wasps have just like started just tearing out big sections of it to try to stop the spread of these parasites. But um, so it depends on when the colony gets infected and uh, how big the infection is, but it's usually going to, it's going to be, it's going to hurt them depending on you know, how bad it's going to depend on you know, a lot of different things. Are you uh, are you going towards you want to do uh, focus on research? I, I don't know. I asked this question of Corey Clark yesterday, but I, it might be a wrong question. Are you focusing on research or being a professor or do you have to do both or do you want to do either? Yeah. So I guess my, my ideal position would be someplace that has a good balance of, of research and teaching. Okay. Um, I don't think I'd want to be doing all of one or the other. If I had okay. to choose, if I had to choose all of one or the other, I'd probably choose maybe all teaching just because I really love teaching. Uh, and hmm. it, the research is, can be very stressful sometimes because, you know, the whole publish or perish like aspect of academia. Hmm. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah, I'm applying to like everything I can, I can possibly find. What kind of teaching uh, do you enjoy most then? Uh, or I guess what, what courses do you, are you proficient at to Im plant like maggots in the nesting brains uh -huh. of the youth <laughs> yeah uh so i haven't got had a chance to teach like full well I, I did a lot of ta work uh when i was in grad school and i'll probably be doing some seminars here but ideally i'd be teaching something like uh, an intro or advanced evolution course hmm. um animal behavior behavioral ecology uh general ecology those are probably uh in my wheelhouse something i could make lectures for, a lecture for now and, and be yeah. confident in talking about um Ideally, I'd like to do maybe like some specialized classes in the future on just like social behavior in general, like a large survey of sociality in the animal kingdom. Mm. Uh, but that would be that would be more like once you're a professor and you can have a little more 
sway and making your own courses yeah. like specialized. But so. is social behavior in animals, I guess that's loosely what you've been uh, working on. But like, what, what are the things that you know enough to like to share with us? I, I, I need to make a more specific question. But oh, yeah, yeah. It's a fascinating. Um, so I would. So probably I, since I study animal personality, it would be sort of more of a the effects of animal personality and how that uh, links to things like how colonies organize labor in their groups. Hmm. So one big finding is that um, is that groups that have like a lot of behavioral diversity, they often use this behavioral diversity hmm. to uh, organize their work. So certain individuals uh, are going to be more equipped for like taking care of offspring, and some are going to be more foragers. Uh, if you look at honeybees, for instance, they have this whole uh, division of labor that's sort of age-based. It's called temporal polyethism and so basically when a worker first emerges they're more likely to just kind of stay inside the colony more and they're going to take care of like the the larvae around them they're going to be quote-unquote nurses uh, and as they get older they'll kind of you know take on maybe more tasks or they'll switch tasks and then the final task is basically before they die is like they're going to be defending the nest and they're going to be the foragers basically hmm. and so you'll you see this uh, this pattern of how how old they are. Then there's other um, organization things like uh, what is it a uh, repertoire expansion? I think is one of their ones where it's kind of similar to temporal polyethism, like age based, but instead of switching tasks, they just like incorporate more and more tasks into their repertoire. And then there's some systems that are just purely based that they they have division of labor based on their specific personalities. So uh, in my spiders, for instance, the bold ones are more likely to go out and okay. catch prey, and the shy ones are more likely to not. Uh, yeah, basically. So, so I'd, say, I'd, say di I'd like to do a course or something on on division of labor and the link between, you know, this this cryptic variation that's in these colonies. Because you'll look at a group of these spiders, and one thing is that they all they're all the same age uh, within a colony. They all look identical, and if you were just to look at them and try to study their their behavior, you wouldn't really know much about them unless you looked at this this thing that you like you know their their behavior their individual behavior you have to the, pixelate the distribution. them distribution yeah. yeah yeah but you but that's something you can't see that's something you need to just you need to assay every single spider in those colonies to see you know what it is that makes this colony more aggressive because without looking at this 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 looking under the hood you're not going to know uh, hmm. this this all this all this variation that's predicting you know, their survival and their task participation. It would just, it would just go right over your head. You would have no idea it's even there. Uh, is, whereas, is there, whereas, I'm sorry, continue. Oh yeah. So, uh, whereas in other species like ants that have, um, well, they also have personality, uh, differences between individuals, but you'll see some species where they have like really big morphological differences between the individuals. You'll have some ants that are really tiny and some that have like the big, the big majors and they have the giant heads and mandibles. And yeah. so it makes sense that you would say like, oh, they're probably performing different tasks because, you know, they're clearly more well suited to different things. Uh, hmm. But but now it's becoming more apparent that, well, colonies are also, you know, uh, organizing tasks based on behavior alone, even when even in the absence of this morphological variation. And this behavior is all emergent. I mean, it the colony isn't telling itself what to do. It just it kind of sifts itself out and and how does that do that it does that do that because there's this uh variation within the group that is suited to these different tasks like i'm just trying to conceptualize yeah. how how that just kind of gets rolling yeah so sometimes it is um, based on just the behavioral distribution of the individuals in the colony uh so you'll you know if you have a colony composed of a lot of aggressive individuals then you'll have an overall more aggressive colony in a lot of cases, or a colony of all shy individuals, more aggressive or more more shy, less more docile colony in general. Um, it's some people call that emergence, but it's not quite because it's just what you might expect. It's just like a product of you know, yeah. this many individuals. It's going to be on average less. But then with the instance of like a keystone individual, you wouldn't be able to predict something like how aggressive a shy colony can be by adding one really bold individual to it. Uh, if you were just looking at the proportion of individuals, so yeah. that would be more of like an, an emergent property of the group uh, that are, you know, it's an effect that's you have one individual that has a disproportionate effect as 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 others do. Uh, so that would be more of like an emergent property. I yeah, guess. The, the 
it, it se- I'm trying to get to a question where I ask yeah. about like the like the amount of distribution or vari- uh, variability in individuals. Uh, does that increase with the complexity of the tasks that the colony needs to perform generally? Mm-hmm. Like, like I'm just, um, I'm imagining, but I don't know h- how many tasks those spiders have to do as, a, as, uh, compared to like a, a beehive with the collecting yeah, yeah. And, and the defense and all that stuff. Yeah. So there is a positive relationship between, uh, metrics of division of labor. So how reliably certain individuals are specializing on certain tasks over others and colony size. So larger colonies tend to have, uh, more division of labor. Um, so they, they tend to be more attempting to streamline their work, I guess, okay. uh, and, and splitting uh, splitting tasks among individuals. And that's probably just because there's just a higher propensity for, for complete chaos in a big yeah. colony of 100,000 ants than there are in a colony of maybe 50 ants. So you need a, there needs to be more mm-hmm. organization, you know, in the mm-hmm. big colonies than smaller ones. And we, that's, a, that's a trend that we see in the spiders too. Um, yeah. The organization goes up as as the uh, number of individuals that need to act mm-hmm. in concert goes up. Yeah, yeah. My question, though, is about the... Is there these different species, like bees and wasps and, and ants and spiders that are social insects, um, are there... Are, do different species have more or less uh, complexity in the way in which they organize life? Like, I just, I assume that a bee colony, not just the size of how many bees there are, but the, the entire structure and how it operates, there's just more functions mm-hmm. involved in maintaining that as opposed to the spider colony. But I, I don't know, maybe the spider yeah, colony yeah. has a whole bunch of different uh, tasks yeah. that it needs to perform. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely true. There's there's a big gradient of, of how, like, the whole there's a whole spectrum of, of how social uh, an organism is. So like ants, bees, wasps, and termites, they're considered a uh, eusocial. That's the, the name you give them. And that's like the highest complexity of sociality that there is. It's uh, basically it's, there's overlapping of, of generations. So you have workers and, and larvae going there. Uh, you also have uh, the, the main defining thing of eusociality is, is reproductive division of labor. So the presence of Queens, uh, and then, so they're, you know, they're just the egg layer and then they're, they have all these basically sterile workers, uh, that are doing, um, basically just the labor for the whole group. And it's in these, these species where you get the most division of labor, the most complexity, uh, that we see in other species. Like and, our, our spiders are not eusocial. They're just sort of subsocial or socialized. There are, there's, and then there's even lower things where they're just like other groups are communal or facultatively social, like they're only social with like, you know, they stumble across the group, like, yeah, they'll join them. So there's all, yeah, there's all differences. So it goes from like a jam band up to the Philharmonic and <laughs> exactly and yeah. how, how ordered yeah. they are. Yeah. It even goes further down the one person just with the guitar <laughs> around the fire yeah. to the and somebody clapping. <laughs> the Philharmonic, exactly. <laughs> and um, you say that you social is the most social. Uh, which is yeah. I never thought about like a, a, a spectrum of sociology, uh, sociability. But what about humans? How social are we? We're super you social. We're, su- we're super. Yeah, I mean, there's been all types of of, of things like that. We, we don't have queens, so we wouldn't be considered you social. But there, are, I know there are people who think that we're just like. And I mean, I would probably agree that we're something different completely uh, than. Hmm than you social or we're kind of another level i mean if you just look at the complexity of like a city if you, if you take the city as like a whole entity or something or even just like a country itself i mean the complexity is out of control yeah so i don't know what we'd call that um th- there's people call you social insects often super organisms um because you'd have to you, you really treat the entire colony itself as one organism and since the workers are sterile are often treated as just like like somatic cells of a body like the, hmm. the the queen is the only true individual in the group because she's the only one who's getting reproductive value hmm. uh and so i don't know if, if I'm, I'm sure people have probably probably tried to call humans a type of super organism uh but i don't i don't know if super organism needs to have queen or not in there yeah um there's probably 
probably people talking about that. I wonder if the if the proliferation of tasks either gives rise to or manifests or allows for the manifestation of the proliferation of personality traits. Because we go from something like the spider where your personality trait that you're able to test at least is boldness versus shyness, right? Mm -hmm. Up to a human being where we have like these five traits or whatever number of traits if we want to go to Enneagram yeah. or astrology or whatever like that. But I wonder if the if the propensity of us to be able to do a spectrum, a huge spectrum of behavior larger than any animal out there uh, gives rise to the ability either of possessing much more personality distribution or manifesting more personality uh, distribution mm. or difference. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to like to really parse those out because, you know, humans, as I said, they can, you can, they can fill out surveys and we have much more, cognitive capacity yeah. to maybe do a bunch of different behaviors than yeah. say an, an ant and stuff. But even, you know, even ants, they have wildly complex personalities and the jobs that they can do. Really? Um, oh yeah. They have all, all kinds of, yeah, there's lots of variation. In fact, I mean, usually what we see hmm. is that, is that personality, really strong personalities tend to be associated with, with social groups a lot. So you'll have certain solitary individuals, and you'll see you'll still see personality variations, sometimes quite strong, uh, but you really see it to, uh, really come out in groups that are social. Hmm. And this is thought to be because yeah, you know, they need to take care of those like the, that that division of labor in the colony. And so it's actually the a behavioral diversity is actually uh, an adaptation to group living, hmm. uh, whereas if you're a solitary individual, um, you know it's maybe not quite as important. To distinguish and, yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's also I have some thoughts, too, about, you know, what, I guess, um, how this might re relate to, like, political parties and stuff, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you want to go down that route sure. at all. Let's but go. it could be. So it's, it's only stuff I've been thinking about maybe in the last few months. Uh, but so th there's this idea that you have these solitary individuals, okay? They're, they still have personality, sometimes pretty robust personalities. But they kind of have a problem because an individual can't be two things at the same time. Okay, so you can't be simultaneously aggressive and docile. Mm. Okay, but sometimes being aggressive is good in one context, but it's not good in another context. So uh, mm. we, we see this um, uh, in certain species. Uh, I, I know it in spiders. I'm sure there's others, but it's called... Uh, the aggressive spillover hypothesis, and it's now a phenomenon that's known. So in this one species of, of fishing spider, and I know it's been done other spiders too, and I'm sure other things, uh, but there's this interesting phenomenon you see with them is that some of them are so aggressive that they are essentially behaviorally sterilizing themselves. So they'll have these females that kill every single male that tries to mate with them. Yeah. And so, and this was just, you know, scientists look at this like, well, this is clearly not adaptive. If you're so aggressive, you know, how, how are you, how are you going to reproduce? Like this is going to be, have a hard selection against. And so this was just like this big, you know, paradox basically, uh, until they looked at more of the, the, the lifetime, the life history of these, of these spiders. And what they found is that in early life stages, there's very strong selection on being aggressive because you need to be really aggressive as a young spider to get enough food uh, to, you know, defend yourself against attackers. Uh, and so there's just incredibly, only, only the most aggressive spiders even make it to adulthood. Yeah. <laughs> but since you have the strong selection pressure on aggressiveness early on, then you get, on average, really, really aggressive adults. So most of the adults, they're, you know, they're doing well. Uh, they're not so aggressive. They, they might, you know, kill every other male that comes around, but they're still they're still reproducing and and, and mating. But you, a byproduct of this is that you will have some individuals that are behaviorally sterilizing themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, if you were just looking mm -hmm. at that the the end of their life cycle, you wouldn't be able to. You would this would look maladaptive. Yeah. And it is in that context, but it's not in like an earlier context. Oh. So, um, but groups kind of get around this this problem. So there's this idea, it's called social heterosis, where, you know, I might be aggressive all the time, and that's probably going to be bad if I'm trying to raise offspring, but it's probably good if I'm trying to defend my colony. But if I'm in a group of individuals, 
well, this other individual can be docile when docility is called for, yeah. and I can be aggressive when aggressiveness is, is called for. And so yeah. this is just like the adaptation of, of, of aggressiveness uh, or so of, of behavioral diversity in like a social group. Um, and we know that things like the behavioral composition of groups is linked to what we were talking about, to the division of labor and group survival. Mm-hmm. Um, and the groups that have sort of a more like fission fusion dynamic, if there's a lot of emigration or immigration into a group, they're more likely going to be more behaviorally diverse just because hmm. they're getting they're getting diversity coming in and out yeah. and all over the place. But in things like, say, ants, bees, and wasps, they have much more like strict rules of of membership. You know, if you if hmm. you ever had like two ant colonies on like a, a fence, you know, going on two different sides, and you know, some when I was a kid, I put like a stick that would connect both those. You know, this is going to cause hell. They just attack each other nonstop. Uh, hmm. And so, the link to politics I see now hmm. is that we're so politically polarized that there's not a lot of immigration immigration of both ideas and of of individuals that of, are individuals. doing of, yeah of, of doing more bipartisanship i mean we see i know they've hmm. done there've been some studies where they've looked at like they've mapped uh what is it, like a networks of of people on social media who belong to you know the left and the right and it's just over time they're just getting more and more separated there's just like less and less crosstalk there's just more echo chambers mm-hmm. as you go as you go down and we know that political orientation is associated with with certain personality types. So I think liberals are more o- uh, high in openness. Yeah. And um, industriousness and yeah, conscientiousness I, I, for conservatives, if I recall correctly. Yeah. And then there's also John Haidt has his yeah. his moral foundations, and you know this you know being liberal is more associated with you know high fairness and care, whereas as um, being conservative is more associated with sort they're sort of like all Loyalty, all five yeah. foundations are used more equally, mm-hmm. I suppose. And so what I think we could be seeing to some degree is this self-selection of of groups just getting more and more entrenched. And then when you get when you get less crosstalk, then you have less behavioral variation within these groups. Mm-hmm. so the so the any any emergent property that's going to come out from having groups that are not, I guess that have this lower diversity is you're going to, you're going to see these emergent properties come out. That's a result of this decreased diversity of just Hmm. having, you know, a a group defined by using two moral foundations or two aspects of Hmm. the big five personality. Uh, Whereas if you had before, if there was more political crosstalk, you'd have, uh, you know, you'd have individuals that will be able to check, you know, the deficiencies of other groups. And so this is something I've just been, kind of loosely thinking about recently and I think that's it could potentially be what's going on in the political realm just this this tightening of group membership yeah. and especially on you know our left like social justice aspect when I mean, you have these like purity tests that they go through yeah. you know they they it's just anyone who doesn't toe the line is immediately exiled and you're the other and then we see these groups um such as you know this this far these far left groups that are emphasizing things like this this uh, fairness and care to the detriment of other groups. You know, we're seeing yeah. things like, um, you know, m- males competing in, in women's leagues and stuff like that, because that mixed with the whole intersectionality thing is, is now we can actually quantify who needs to be treated more fairly or who should be cared for the most. <laughs> and now this is, and then it gets, it gets into a position where like, well, you know, we, we care about women, but you know, they're on a different level than trans individuals. And so yeah. this is, this is what happens when, when the care and fairness foundations yeah. just spin out of control because yeah. they're just so polarized now. So it's, uh, I guess those are kind of, yeah, that's, that's kind of the only link I can make of animal personality research to maybe comment on yeah. what we may be seeing nowadays. I don't know how tight that's going to be. <laughs> and I'm it's, sure there's a lot of... It's kind of funny that right we're at a point in the discussion, and not just our discussion, but the political discussion at large, that the term being treated more fair we can say that with a straight face and not really gawk at the uh, grok at the no gawk yeah gawk at the uh, 
absurdity of being treated more fair than somebody yeah, else yeah, or yeah. going anyway. Yeah, yeah. But I was thinking about um, that concept of the keystone individual and want to marry it with the idea of uh, which goes into the way in which these groups compete with each other using media. Uh, they they seem to seek the straw keystone individual. Um, I could sh probably uh, in probably 25 minutes put together a poster of the, the straw keystone individual for the left and the right. I, I can just I can imagine all the people on the left mm -hmm. like just I can assemble like these 20 minute video clips of like all these people that we all know that we can recognize as the out of control SJW. And then for the uh -huh. right, we can go through and we can find like. You know, just like the basically the neo Nazis and the Richard Spencers and yeah. stuff, and and so in in a certain way, the groups um, they use these Keystone individuals to vilify the other group, and I, I participate mm -hmm. in that too when I when I need to make fun of a group, like I like because yeah. that's the the becomes the icon for everything that is like the the re, reducto ad absurdum. It, it, uh, is formulated into like a keystone individual uh -huh. in a way. Yeah, I've never thought about that before. It's interesting to think about the keystone can be you know, like a concept, a, re a representative of of something. Yeah, because we have one group on the left, like they're yeah, they have that straw, that straw man, that 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 ultimate villain that does motivate their group to do things. But I'm trying to think of it, if that could be considered a true keystone because. Mm. Like the the idea of an individual oh, yeah. isn't isn't like an individual itself in a way, um, but I guess huh. I mean, sometimes they can point to real individuals who are doing things. Like maybe yeah. maybe you could point to like, you know, extremes like you know Harvey Weinstein or something like that. Yeah, could be, yeah, exactly. Could be yeah. could be an individual that's well, it's the scapegoat. Um, the scapegoat is yeah. basically a keystone individual that defines the group against it. it it's it's an yeah. inversion of the keystone. Instead of that individual influencing everybody, either positively or negatively, the group is electing mm. them as a representation of that which they want to get rid of or, or banish. Yeah, yeah. This is also probably a lot of just like tribal things going. You know, you want to portray the enemy in as most like vile terms as possible, then that's just gonna mm -hmm. get people's tribal instincts going in a certain way. Just like look how vile these people are. You know, they're they're Nazis, like they're the worst thing in the world. Yeah. And so it just makes people, you know, and make, again it contributes to that polarization, which is gonna mm -hmm. maybe contribute to the effects of those those tightened membership bringing out those emergent behaviors of the of the individuals that are composing those groups. Yeah. What what's your consideration? Uh there the internet gets a lot of flack for, you know, being a cesspool and just being a horrible place where everybody's like treating each other uh, deplorably. Um, but I keep on running into intelligent people because of this thing. And it seems like someone such as yourself, who's a scientist uh, and a nerd, not in a bad way, but you're kind of a nerd. But because of this platform, like, let's just say Twitter, because that's the only way that I, I know how you interact with online. You are able to uh, be an ambassador for uh, scientism. You're also able to start to interact with people of different political views and then start translating your knowledge into something mm -hmm. that other people can enjoy. What What's your experience of that? And how do you look at your role as a scientist in the public conversation? Yeah. So it's it's changed. Well, it's actually it's been the same, but I've just been manifesting it differently. So there was a long. I, I was I've only been on Twitter for like actually since maybe October of last year in a real way. Okay. Like I was I was very much self censoring, just for the last seven years or so, just because, you know, I was on the path where I was in graduate school. The people I'm around, my cohort is extremely, you know, extremely liberal. Um, and hmm. I would just kind of go with it. You know, I was the people that all the social circles I was in before were mostly uh, pretty, pretty far left. And then as more and more professors, they started like, you know, following me on my Facebook. Whereas before, like back in the day when I was, you know, like a, the new atheist craze and I was, you know, posting all this stuff about, you know, look at these crazy creationists, like no one cared about that. But once they start getting more, you know, professors yeah follow me on facebook or social media then it's just you know there's certain things i might not want to post yeah. anymore and then hmm. in every 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 future further stage of my progression as a scientist there was just more and more to lose by 
by posting things that could be controversial. Mm -hmm. So as I get closer to, to graduating, like when I, before I got my dissertation all done, you know, I'm, I'm moving to different schools because I, I switched labs and there's more professors who are following me. And so now I want to look for a postdoc, you know, so I'm in that phase and, you know, I, I want to make sure that my online presence is squeaky clean because I don't want something to come up and have that make it so I don't get a postdoc position. Hmm. Uh, and then, you know, okay, and I, now I got my postdoc position, but now I'm looking for faculty jobs and, you know, that's even bigger and, and now I have to self-censor even more. And, you know, and then I was looking at the long road and it was, you know, like, well, when I get a faculty position, then I still don't have tenure and it's going to be six years before I go up for tenure. And so then it's going to be, well, I have to self-censor for another six years. So I'm just looking wow. ahead and saying, like, I'm going to have to self-censor for another decade almost. And then even professors who have tenure have told me, you know, behind closed doors that tenure is not even going to be able to help you in some of these situations if the mob is big enough and they're rapid enough. And so I just got to, and I was I was seeing all this, you know, like, the denial of, of, of sex differences in in personality, and that's taken my field, that's what I study, and I just know that it's flatly false. Denial of you know evolution of, of sex differences between males and females, uh, and then like the, the the rampant biological sex denialism. I don't know how any ways to say it. We see now coming from these groups, and it was just hmm. too unbearable. I I was just like <laughs> steaming, and like I had like. If someone like me isn't going to comment on this, who's studies personality in nature, who knows about evolution and how this works, and is knows what the biological definition of sex is, like if I if I feel hesitant to speak up about this, like who, does anyone else have a chance of speaking up about this? Like, and so mm -hmm. I and 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 also I moved out to Pennsylvania and I'm, I live alone now, so I'm I have this like this isolation thing going out here in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, and so like. I was just going to burst. I needed to, I needed an outlet. And so that's when I wrote like my, my Colette article and you know, everyone around me, like my, my old advisor and like mentors and everyone, you know, they, they said it was like the worst idea. They, well, first they'd say, we agree with you. We agree with everything you wrote in this paper. Like everything is completely true. But then they said, I'd be insane to put my name on this thing. They even said I shouldn't publish it anonymously because it could just, if it gets back to me and then, I don't know why I decided to do it anyway. I think I had like a Christopher, I, I just had like a, I just thought to myself like, what would, what would Christopher Hitchens do or something? And I was just like, <laughs> I know exactly what he'd do. And I just, I just chose the path where I'm not going to have to self-censor. I didn't want to have to choose between yeah. the life of an academic who has to self-censor and a person who's going to be able to be a, a free intellectual free okay. thinker. Like, and, and that's, I mean, that's the reason I chose wow. to, to be a scientist in the first place. Like I, because of the charismatic people and scientists like, you know, Dawkins and Harris and other people. Uh, and so like over time it, it changed very slightly, but like the whole, the, the goal, like once I got close enough to it, it just seems to, to change. It's not what it was like 10 years ago. And I've, I've often thought of it, you know, like, did you ever play Mario 64 back in the day? Long time ago. Yeah, well, there's this one, like, the first time that you that you fight Bowser, <laughs> there's this long hallway, and there's a giant picture on the wall, and it's Princess Peach. <laughs> and so you, you run down this long hallway, and right before you get to the end, Princess Peach, the picture changes to a picture of Bowser, and then you fall in a trap door, and then you're in Bowser's lair. And that's kind of, like, what I used to describe, like, how it was, like, going through... Mm. my whole career trying to get to the place where I'm going to get a faculty position, you know, like early on, like the goal was princess peach. It was something that was, I really, I wanted very much. And then as mm. I got closer now, like now I have to sacrifice free thought, you know, wow. to, uh, and, and being open about this. So yeah, the, the, the closer I got to my goal, it's just the, the, the picture is now distorted and I still want to be a professor. That's what I want to do more than anything. I want to be able to do research and have students and train yeah. a new group of scientists. But I've just decided I, I refuse to, I'm no longer gonna self-censor anymore. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna post things on social media that I think are true or that I know are true. And if any university doesn't wanna hire me because of that, then that's not a place I wanna work at. Yeah, you know, right. If they're gonna say like, sorry, you're a biologist, you said that sex differences are real. Like that's too, if that's too much for them, like what the hell is going on? So, huh. uh, 
yeah, I don't know if it, your question was more about like social media. So yeah, so I've after this, I've been much more active on social media uh, just because I'm out in the open now, I suppose, with okay. my Colette, with a, the Colette article. Uh, How is that shaping to, your, the landscape of, of colleagues for you? Are you do, have you lost a lot? Have you gained a lot? What's the difference? That uh, it's made? No, all my colleagues that I knew very closely, um, they, 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 I mean, they agreed with whatever. There's some who disagree that the problem is as bad as I, I say it is. Um, but the people who are close to me know that I'm, you know, they know I'm not a bigot or anything like that, and that I'm not mm. like a trans transphobe, and so they're fine. It's it's. Um, I mean, there, I haven't gotten you know a lot of hate online, but I mean, most of it's been positive. Uh, the positive thing is hate. Hard... No, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, mostly positive feedback. Only a little bit of hate, but it's hard to tell. Like you know, are the people who hate you are they likely to send you an email telling how much t- telling you how much they hate you? Yeah. Like I'm sure there's still people out there who, who hate me. I see it on. I, mean, I see them on Twitter. And the, the the one variable you can't know is like I don't know if it's going to affect me moving forward trying to get a job because if someone does Google my name on a search committee which they all probably do and they're going to see comments that I've made about you know transgender individuals in in sports yeah and whether or not that's fair and I don't think it is and you can disagree with me and it's more will, fair though yeah. it's undeniable <laughs> <Then what? laughs> <laughs> than them not being in sports I don't know. I mean, it's fair to trans people, I suppose, but <laughs> at the cost of women, uh, females. So, hmm. yeah. So it's it's been a mixed bag, and I, yeah. So I, I don't know, like I don't know all the know. the calls and interviews I'm not getting. Yeah. Because of my views, like this, there's this like a bias. It could be none. It could be this could be in my head. Maybe that doesn't matter one bit. Like I don't know, hmm. but it could. And there's a lot of people who are around me who said that it very well could and probably yeah. will, but. Again, that's this thing I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sacrifice. Yeah. I'm just, and and I have found a lot of people on social media now that are, you know, it's it's a it's a good place to find a community, especially for someone like me who's moved somewhere new by themselves and need a social group. So that's kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's worked out. I've made a lot of a lot of good friends. Okay. So far, yeah, it's been good. Do you think that? Um... What's your feeling? This is this is totally unknown, so you can't use your science uh, mind to tackle oh. this. But what what's your feeling on the influence of you and people like you um, on the academy, uh, and and moving the conversation towards a place where we don't have to deny factual evidence because of a political or moral claim? Do you think it's going think in the right direction, or do you think it's? Uh... So I think that there are more Very and more impaired. people speaking up. I think there might be a a lag effect. Like I think we've had a lot of social justice ramping up, and even though there's a lot more people who are speaking up now, I think maybe in the future it'll start swinging back the other way. Like uh, the, I don't think the effects have have pushed the needle that much right now, but I think it's I think it, I think it will. It's just not it's it's not the pendulum isn't swinging back the other way, but there's a building. Momentum yep. that's gonna, you know, that's, that's beginning to push against it. That's eventually, I mean, I hope, is gonna be able to push back and move it back notches rather than just, mm-hmm. you know. So you're hopeful, right now, but what work? Just, you know, what work needs to be done? What yes, is the I stuff think, that we need to fight for in order to get nature to get off the track <laughs> it's going? I mean, I really think, and this is something I've talked to James Lindsay a, a little bit about is he was actually very, very helpful. In me, he's one of the first people I reached out to before I, I wrote my Colette article, just because I was just so frustrated about this whole self-censoring thing, and wow. and we had a we had a good back and forth through email. I hope I'm allowed to say that. I won't talk to him. I won't, I won't <laughs> talk about the emails, like the contents, but it was basically like hmm. uh, the the importance of just people speaking up, and that there needs to be once a certain quorum is reached of individuals who are willing to just say, you know, this isn't true. You know, it's kind of like, you know, if you think about the the feminist movement in a way, uh, when they make people think twice when they say something like, uh, you know, using say male pronouns to talk about everyone, and now it's sort of a faux pas if you don't say like he or she or they or something. You know, it's just making making that inclusive inclusive language. Uh, it makes people think like, oh, you know, like yeah, I need to start using more uh, words that are going to be you know acknowledging the broad spectrum of people. Um, but and I so I, I think people need to you have that same sort of hang up when they hear people talk about just 
things that are flatly false. There need to be people that come out and just will be able to call it what it is, or you know. But it's it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna need to be. What am I trying to say? It's, it's going to you, be... you want a politically uh, correct uh, brigade that actually is factually c- correct brigade. Yeah, I, mean, yeah brigade. I want I want people to not be afraid to just calmly engage with ideas that they think are bad and not have. I mean, because I think the reason people don't engage is because of the narrative on the other side, where they they hmm. they take all criticism of their ideology as a criticism of their humanity and. I think that's that's the move that they do and the, the way that they okay. interpret this just so they can immediately call you a bigot and then not have to hmm. deal with your mm-hmm. views. If they can mm-hmm. just categorize you as a bad person saying bad things because you're a bad person, then that, then the conversation doesn't happen for them. Mm. Uh, and so I think people just need to be, I guess, a bold spider and just get out there and, and not be afraid of for people to tell you huh. that you're a bad person because... You know yourself better. You know your motivations. No one can tell you what your motivation is. I know that I'm not motivated by hatred of trans people when I say that I don't think that trans women should be able to play against biological females in powerlifting. Like, I, there's, a, there's not a transphobic bone in my body. Like, I'm mm-hmm. more than happy to use whatever pronoun that they would like me to use and treat them as an equal and, you know, any, any right and treat the, the dignity, dignity and respect that you'd want to give any human being. But... I, you're their right to, you know, be a power lifter is not can't impede on the rights of biological females, mm-hmm. and they'll call me a transphobe for it. And you know, that's just something that I'm okay with now. Like okay. you, they can, and I think more people need to be okay with having people be called this, hmm. uh, especially when they know it's not true, because that's that's the that's the way that they're keeping people silent. And it's going to take more and more people speaking up to. To actually start changing the tide. We need it to be a faux pas to call people hmm. a transphobe or a bigot or a Nazi. Like that needs to be the faux pas, not hmm. someone trying to engage reasonably with, with ideas. Yeah, it's interesting that Twitter's decided to go in the opposite direction and now is banning trans people who are saying what you just said. Um, yeah, exactly. So there, yeah, Twitter has, they've really, they've chosen a specific definition of gender which is like the gender self ID definition that we see in the trans community. Uh, they've just decided that that's the, that's the definition that's real or true. Hmm. Um, whereas you have, you know, the radical feminists, they have their own whole conception of gender. So when they tell a trans person, you know, when they refer to the, like a trans woman as he, like to them, that's not misgendering because the whole radical feminist idea of gender is completely different than the gender self ID people. Uh, hmm. Yeah. So you're getting Twitter banning people for not, using like the the agreed upon hmm. you know self id trans rights activist definition uh so but when i'm engaging with people on twitter talking about gender or sex i make sure to just to i, I try not to talk about gender that much i try to just talk about sex because that's what that's what i think is the most important i make sure to use male and female when i'm yeah. talking about sex and then you'll see them try to bait you though they'll be like they'll they'll use you'll be hmm. using sex terms male and female and they're saying like like you'll i'll say something like males cannot get pregnant and then someone will say like yes men can get pregnant here's a link and it's it's a trans man so a biological woman who gave birth and it's like well that's no more shocking than any woman having a baby any female having a baby (laughs) and so like they'll try to get you to say men can't get pregnant because then that's you know they're trying to get you to misgender according to their their ideology then they can Mm. flag you for hate speech because twitter seems to support that specific definition Uh, Mm. i'm actually going to be writing something about the different definitions of gender that are out there that are leading to so much confusion right now especially on twitter because there's at least five different definitions of of gender that everyone thinks everyone is using when (laughs) everyone, everyone assumes that everyone knows what they're talking about when they say gender but it's couldn't be further from the truth you know what there's it seems like th- this might be a broken metaphor from the get-go but it seems like uh social media is it's a beehive without a task it's a beehive without an ability for us to organize ourselves because we don't really know the task and that that came to my head when you're just talking about gender like why do we have five different terms for gender because we have five different realities that people are 
trying to yeah. combat or, or forward or make true or mm-hmm. realize, let's say. Um, but but what's the real task and how do we get all on the same page? Like, what is the task of this beehive? And will we ever be able yeah. to organize without going into tribalism, which I think is like the primary, uh, the, the most primitive form of organization for human beings would to just be fine people that agree with you. Mm-hmm. And then participate in some conflict, you know, in order yeah. to exert your tribe. I think, I mean, the, the task has to be some sort of call back to realism in some way you know can't just say that deconstruction is the new thing where there's nothing nothing is real there's no distinction to be made about anything and language can mean one of an infinite number of things because then there's just that's just insanity that that way Mm -hmm. like there's nothing if we can't use language to refer to specific things okay then there's just there's nothing (laughs) that could that can come of that like at all (laughs) If the words, I mean, first, I mean, I was originally okay with the split of, you know, man, woman, and male, female, because a lot of times, you know, man and woman uh, were kind of used synonymously with male, female, at least historically and in, in, in certain medical definitions. And then when when trans people came out and said, you know, a man, woman is more of a, an expression of mm. sexes. You now I was just like, okay. I can get a lot. I can go with that. We why we have these different words. Why not give them totally different meanings now? But then, once that seems to be that it was it was a bait and switch now. Whereas hmm. once they got a lot of people, and I think a lot of people were probably pretty on board with that. At least, at least I was to some degree. I thought there you know some problems, but you know mostly it's okay. But now we're seeing that they want to be called like trans women want to be called female now, and it's just that's that's a ground that you know. As a thinking person, as a biologist especially, I'm I won't, I, I'm not willing to concede. So, you, so you're drawing words. the line at the female penis, then? That's where you draw. The yes, line. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, those posts were ridiculous the other day. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a lot going on. I feel I feel like we've definitely reached like peak insanity. But I say that almost every week. So yeah. We'll see. <laughs> you know, I think in in a way we're a, a bunch of dogs chasing the newest insanity, you know, uh, bucket yeah. the, or car or tin can strapped to a, you know, lorry going down the street. I think, yeah. I mean, just looking at this past year, every week there's some topic that everybody's got to have a little hot take about. And I'm, maybe that's just Twitter and it's always been that way. But like with just one thing after another thing after another thing, I'm like, what is the point? Why are we even here? Yeah, Why aren't we telling more jokes and like sharing? What can we go back to like sharing pictures of our dinner? Like, the, yeah, <laughs> I guess no, the... I, I definitely. I wish I didn't. Yeah, I mean, it's, sometimes it gets, gets stressful. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. it's just. I mean, I've I've had times where I wake up in the morning and I'll just like check, you know, my Twitter inbox and there'll be something and I'll just, I'll just ruin my mood for the day. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> that's, not, that's not good. I can't start out with start out with anger. That shouldn't be the first emotion that you get. So I'm I'm trying to be better at like. You know, regulating, just yeah. not caring. I mean, I'm still caring, but I don't know. Yeah, getting better at moderating my 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 time on there and how it influences me. You're. Uh, it seems like you're going down the article path. You're going to keep on writing articles for the foreseeable future. Do you have a book that you're you've been thinking about writing? I'm. I am thinking about it. Yeah, I was thinking about turning my Colette article, among other. Th- ideas with it too into something that's more book length um that's just Hmm. i've only just thought about i have a few chapter outlines but nothing has been like seriously set down yet i'm trying to find time to do stuff but i've got a lot of you know academic papers and projects i'm doing so it's hard to find good chunks of time i mean on the weekends i'll I'll be able to do stuff at it but yeah. I wish I could devote more time to doing that for sure. Yeah, and then you're yeah. gonna have some bugs hatching pretty soon, right? Yes, for sure. Wasps <laughs> are coming out in the next month or so, so I gotta <laughs> get ready do you, for those. Do you guys do a video of this stuff and time lapse, and you get little cameras up in the nests and stuff like that, or? Um, not for the wasps. I mean, oh. I have I have videos of the wasps when I did the whole like colony level behavior essays because. We we analyzed the video to find out how oh, aggressive okay. colonies were, basically. But no no like long term time lapse things or anything. But uh, that'd be pretty cool to get a time lapse of a whole wasp colony. It's something I could probably do. You should probably do that. It'd be fun <laughs> to have on a just as a 
on a PowerPoint for a conference or something. Well, I'm thinking on a green screen while I'm interviewing the, the next oh, time. Oh, yeah. Just have, like, <laughs> going on. Yeah, I should get one of those. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to be doing this regular, why not? Yeah, I'd like to be doing more more podcast type stuff and getting out there as much as possible. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, I've decided that I'll take any any public appearance anyone wants to throw my way. <laughs> so, <laughs> cool. no, that's not it's not too you know problematic to use a word I don't like to use. Oh well, but, you, uh, get, you still have to have that in your repertoire. Yeah, I mean, I got so much hate from people from just being on. RT America, the doing the live thing I did. Oh, really? Uh, because it's you know it's it's, it's Russian owned and everyone's just like, oh. How, Russia's our enemy. How could you? Yeah. Just like, they're the only ones who reached out. Sorry, like they didn't tell me what to say. Like I they didn't even know the questions mm. until like five minutes before I went on. So hmm. they didn't censor anything. It was full live. So yeah. Well, I'm reasonably certain that you're among good company uh, in my repertoire of interviews. I'm I'm not funded by Russia. Um, I know that for sure. It's going to come out, <laughs> and then I'm screwed. 